I mean, oh, in yeah, his Lieberman. heart, he wanted he, Lieberman. He wanted Lieberman. Yeah, I, I mean, guess. and that is a lady or the tiger. Hello and welcome to the Bulwark's Next Level Sunday interview. I'm your host, Tim Miller, here with my BFF, JVL, and his old pal, I guess, his old basketball buddy, maybe, uh, and one of the greatest, maybe the best, nonfiction writer out there these days, David Grand. You might know him from The Lost City of Z. Uh, Killers of Flower Moon, which has been made into a movie recently with a couple of people that you might have heard of, and uh, in his most recent book, The Wager. David, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Nobody looking at this cast will say, oh, he once played basketball. basketball. But it is true, in another <laughs> lifetime, I could hit a layup occasionally. I was confused <laughs> about this. So do you want to, do, do you have any, do you have any reflections on 22-year-old JVL? Was he always as dark as this? Was he as negative on the basketball court he was, as he, he is he in his a, newsletter? He was as intense as ever. <laughs> <laughs> I was like a big puppy. And, uh, and <laughs> this is like, David and I were the young guys playing pickup ball with a bunch of like middle-aged journalists. And it was uh, it was a good time. We got together it was a on good Tuesday time, but I think the middle aged journalists were better than us, which was very sad. But yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There were there were a couple who could play. <laughs> um, David, I want JVL to kind of take the lead on your uh, writing and movie career, since he's he's the nerd in those areas. But if you if you would indulge me, can we reflect back on your politics days a little bit first, since this is ostensibly a politics podcast? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, you covered in 2000. You were one of the first people on the McCain bus, as I yes. recall, um, yeah. with some of my some of my buddies um, who were his uh, consultants at the time. And then you went back and kind of covered what, well, I guess it wasn't really the end of McCain, but the end of the 08 campaign. Um, yes. You know, after he had you know, sort of succumbed to the party, uh, the party Pumas and to Sarah Palin, et cetera. Did you cover him again after that? Did you cover No, him? that was the last time I covered it. You know, when he lost, I was there at his, um, you know, his concession speech that he gave or Palin didn't give her speech. I will say, um, uh, you know, when I first started covering McCain, it was 2000. And at that time, he had not yet taken off in the primaries. He kind of became a sensation. But that had not yet happened when I got assigned to him. I was working for the New Republic at the time. And I remember when I showed up to cover him, there were only two reporters. It was me and a young David Brooks for the Weekly Standard. And we traveled with McCain. And, and McCain back then was wonderfully accessible. Um, as many reporters knew, um, but he was yeah. particularly accessible then because there's only two of us. So we just, we traveled on a little plane with him and Cindy was there, I think for part of it and uh, ate with him, ate with, you know, the consultants were around as well. So um, it was very different than when I showed up again, because um, I didn't cover politics, you know, in, in, in later recent years, I had not covered politics a lot. Um, I was at the New Yorker. They asked me if I would do uh a campaign piece. So I said, well, I covered McCain before. I thought it would be interesting to follow him again. Although it was a very different vibe when I showed up to cover the last campaign. I think by then uh, the sense was that he was probably going to lose and the accessibility was gone. The kind of joyous McCain that I had remembered kind of on the campaign bus back in 2000 was, was really not as uh, prevalent. Maybe it was behind closed doors, but he wasn't showing it as much. I don't think so. I don't think yeah. it was um, behind closed doors. I want, So I was curious now, we have, we're what, 15 years after that? And if you're like looking back in retrospect, one of the things we talk about a lot, the Bulwark, obviously, since we're working through how all this craziness came to be, um, like was... Was it inevitable in your sense that McCain like succumbed to the, you know, forces of, uh, I don't know, this kind of Frankenstein evangelical populism of Sarah Palin that of the party elites or do you, you know, and, and was that kind of the trajectory things were on and, and McCain was this lonely fighter against it? It's one way to look at it. Another way is that maybe, you know, I, McCain didn't really stick to his guns as much as he could have. And maybe there was an alternate history had, you know, he can, had he, you know, stuck out the more mavericky approach and not for all the things I hate about Trump, Trump really didn't kind of succumb to what the party people, people wanted, I, you know, and in a lot of areas, he still like has his weird heterodox views about leaving NATO and shit like that stuff that, you know what I mean? Uh, and, and McCain kind of, did. And so I, I wonder how you see that yeah. now, kind of a decade and a half on. It's a really good question. I, I will confess, I haven't thought much about it, but looking back, and as you ask me now, and this is just kind of off the cuff, so yeah, I sure, change please. if I were to think about it <laughs> later, but 
I do think it was a very pivotal moment uh, in American politics when I think back on that moment. And I thought what you saw with McCain is the internal division, both within the campaign that I was picking on up and even with him to kind of go back to the kind of 2000, kind of let loose, um, um, kind of run that version of his campaign versus succumbing to the populist pressures that were increasingly taking over the Republican Party, obviously accelerated by his pick of Palin, who became the kind of progenitor of those forces. And you could see that divide. And I remember covering it, and it had a whiff of tragedy about it, both for him uh, and both for American politics. And in his very fine concession speech, that was when you saw a glimmer of the McCain that had been kind of lost in the preceding months as he tried to accommodate himself to these populist forces, again, at least as as I witnessed them. So I do think, and I hadn't really thought so much about this, but now looking back with hindsight, that that, you know, not just his pick of Palin, but what represented in that moment and the succumbing to those forces, he was divided, you could, he was unhappy. You could pick up those internal tensions as he tried to balance them. Um, but it was a pivotal moment because he did succumb to them in many ways. And he did obviously pick Pale. Yeah. One more thing on this. And uh, I was going to challenge your memory. I was listening to some old podcasts of yours. You're talking about how you were reporting at the time about how like he, before he ran in 08, like, so after the 2000 campaign, before he ran in 08, he was like kind of seriously thinking about going an independent bid. I, like he was thinking about lots of different things. It is kind of, inter- I, I wonder, do you have any recollections of that? I mean, talk about sliding doors. Like you think about, like had McCain, you know, gone that route rather than, you know, gone the Jerry Falwell, Sarah Palin route. I don't, yeah. I don't know. Maybe we end up in the same place with Trump. Who the hell knows? But it, it's a kind of interesting. I, I don't yeah, know. Do you remember I, that at all? Just a little bit with the flirtation. I don't remember. To be honest, I don't remember that. Well, I do remember 2000, especially when he uh, began to be kind of overcome in the primary. There were certain people within his circle, if I remember correctly, who, yeah. you know, wanted him to kind of stay on the campaign and maybe run as an independent. Um, I, I, from memory, I don't think it was that serious, but someone might correct me on that, how seriously it was engaged. Um, and I also think the realities of American politics always seem to preclude that possibility as much as there's always an excitement around it. I think back then, um, how realistic would have been for him to run as an independent were probably small, but um, there are a lot of sliding doors. I mean, he was basically taken out in South Carolina. South Carolina proved to be uh, in that 2000 campaign. Right. It was a very pivotal moment. And um, he was really taken out. It was a really ugly campaign. I mean, I was there in South Carolina. I don't know how many people remember it, but I mean, it was about as slimy a campaign as I had covered. And, I, you know, I had been doing politics that long, but I've been doing it for, at that point, probably about six years. And, uh, you know, and I covered some pretty slimy stuff, but that was a really nasty, underhanded dirty campaign. And then they, they took him out. But that was a very kind of pivotal moment there, too. So that's another uh, kind of slide. Yeah. What would have happened had he not been taken out there? Yeah. Um, so there, there are many. Uh, you know, it, it, what is an interesting question is, could a figure have, have stopped the forces? I know you guys focus a lot on this. I follow your work a lot. I don't do politics anymore, but I do follow you miss it. it? Not covering it so much. I like listening to you all cover it. Um, but what is interesting is how much is there kind of contingency in history? How much could figures or moments have changed the trajectory? And I don't know the answer to that question. The forces were obviously so strong, you could see them slowly, incrementally consuming figures. And you see the kind of, and it keeps going further and further. We don't think it would go and it keeps kind of going until it's kind of eating itself. I mean, I remember I first started covering politics in 1994 and that was the rise of Gingrich. And Gingrich in many ways helped unleash many of these forces. So that was kind of an early moment, but you could, you know, you just see it kind of progressing and progressing. Then you see the critical pivotal moment with McCain and Pat Palin. And of course, from there, you know, we are where we are today. Yeah. Well, Do you guys move. remember who he wanted 
I mean, oh, in yeah, his Lieberman. heart, he wanted he, Lieberman. He wanted Lieberman. Yeah, and, I mean, yes. and that is a lady or the tiger, right? Yes, um, yes. And I, yeah. and I, you know, and he clearly wanted Lieberman. And that was, the, you know, uh, and I, you know, that was another uh, moment when he kind of decided to go with the forces that be, you know, the, the, you know, the calculus, the calculation. And, you know, McCain was always a politician. I mean, he always was, even in his Maverick days. Yeah, he was pissed about it. I was I interviewed for my book some of his old some of the old files yeah. about the time, and they say to this day, like he he like almost didn't campaign for a week. Like he was so mad and he was so angry when they kind of everybody around him forced him not to pick Lieberman. Okay, well from the from the uplifting um, Republican <laughs> descent into populism, let's move to something else, JVL, um, that I think could lift our spirits: the raping and the pillaging of the Osage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> how do you where do you want to start? So uh, we'll start with what everybody who uh, so there are people who who know you and love you, David, uh, including those of us here where I am the president of the David Grand <laughs> fan club. Um, but for people who, who don't know you, what they would know is right now in theaters, there is a movie uh, directed by Martin Scorsese starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro called Killers of the Flower Moon. And this is based on a book that you wrote. Uh, and I, I'm going to give just a very quick thumbnail sketch unless you want to do it maybe your thumbnail sketch would be better than mine since you actually wrote the book could you get just for again for people just tuning in sure. give them give them the the elevator pitch yeah so um it was about um members of the osage nation who in the early parts of the 20th century had become among the wealthiest people per capita in the world because of oil deposits under their land uh in the year 1923 alone uh, there were about 2,000 Osage on the tribal roll, and they received what would be worth today more than $400 million. And then they began to be serially murdered in one of the more monstrous conspiracies and racial injustices in American history. Um, and it would become one of the early FBI uh, major homicide cases as well. And so you... Uh... This was a remarkable story for you to go and tell, and we'll get to the story itself. But just, well, now, you know, let's start with the story itself, and then we'll go to what it's like having your book turned into a prestige movie, which is weird. Um, how did you fall in love with this particular story? Because normally your MO as a, as a writer and reporter is you find cracks and crevices of, you know, stories, which maybe somebody knew a little bit about at the time, but have forgotten about, but the, where there's still a lot to uncover. And you did wind up uncovering a bunch of stuff in this, but how did you know going in? Like what, yeah. you know, when you were looking at this, what, what brought you to it? Yeah. So uh, somebody, a historian had mentioned the case to me and didn't know much about it, but had mentioned it to me and it prompted my interest. And then I tried to see if there was, you know, materials written about it. I really couldn't find uh, much of anything. Um, and so on my own dime, I decided to go visit the Osage Nation out in Oklahoma. At that time, I really wasn't thinking about writing a book. Um, I thought, well, maybe, maybe there'll be an article here, but I was interested enough to go. And I went out there. And the first thing I did when I visited, you know, you do that thing, what you do, we should go visit a place you don't know. Well, I'll go to the museum. So I went to the yeah. Osage Nation Museum. Um, and I saw this large panoramic photograph on the wall that was taken in 1924. And it showed members of the Osage Nation along with white settlers. Uh, and I was standing there. The first thing I was thinking about was I couldn't believe you could take a panoramic photograph like that back in the 1920s because it was just so huge. I just didn't know that was even technologically possible. So I was kind of studying it there. And I then noticed that to the very left of the photograph when I was facing it, a part had been cut out. And... Um, I asked the museum director, Catherine Redcorn, who I was meeting for the first time, and she's since become a good friend of mine. I said to her, you know, why is that part of that photograph missing? And she said, well, you know, it had contained this figure so frightening, she had decided to remove it. And then she pointed to that missing panel and she said the devil was standing right there. And she, she went down in the basement and she brought up an image of the missing panel, which showed one of the killers uh, of the Osage uh, during this period, one of the masterminds of several killings. And, you know, it's very rare that a book has an origin story, but this book really had this kind of weird origin story in that I just kept thinking about that picture that the Osage had removed and not to forget what had happened, but because they can't forget. And yet here there were people like me who had never been taught this, had never learned this. We had basically wiped this from our conscience. So that was what kind of propelled me in many ways to address my own ignorance, which is usually what propels me on most of my stories. 
So what was it? Was it Hale? Was he the one? It was Hale. It was William yeah. K. Hale. That he was the devil in the photograph. That is correct. So uh, Hale, the official death toll on this is what? Like 20 murders. But you think there were many, many more. Yeah. So the official death toll, of, um, you know, when you go back to the time and you read the FBI records and the criminal, the investigatory transcripts and the court records, uh, was at least 24. The official death toll was at least 24. Um, but when you really begin to dig into the case, you begin to get evidence of many more killings. And I can just illuminate a little bit about, about that if you want, um, because I think it's important. Um, because when I began the story and researching the story, and I always say this when you begin a book or a project, you always have to keep an open mind. Um, I had kind of assumed that this was um, a criminal case about a singular evil figure, William K. Hill, who had committed these crimes along with a couple of henchmen. And I thought that because that was the FBI's theory of the case. And when you read about it, that's what was always said. Um, but when I spent a lot of time, I spent more than half a decade researching the project. I would live out for a couple months out in uh, Osage territory on, on the reservation, interviewing Osage elders. And many of them would tell me about other suspicious deaths in their families that were not linked to Hale. Um, and I also spent a lot of time in the archives. There's a huge branch of the National Archives out in Fort Worth, Texas, which is like something out of Readers of the Lost Ark where they stick the last covenant. You could fit about, I don't know how many airplanes in that room, but a lot. And um, I was pulling records um, uh, on what was known as the guardianship system, which was this very racist system which the U.S. government passed in which because those states were wealthy, the U.S. government actually appointed white guardians to manage their fortunes, which was just, you know, an important system. Um, and I was um, pulling records on which... I was looking for a simple fact about if a certain Osage had had a certain guardian. And I pulled all these records. And in one of the boxes, I had found this little booklet that was um, it had a fabric cover. And all it contained was the names of the guardians and whose Osage's fortunes they had managed. And yet written next to the Osage's, um, the only other thing written in the book was if one of the Osage's had died, some anonymous bureaucrat had written the word dead. And so when I was opening and I was looking at it, I saw a guardian who had about six Osage fortunes who they managed. I noticed the word dead written next to the first name, the second name, the third name, the fourth name, the fifth name, all six dead. I thought, well, that's nuts. And then I began looking through the book, but I saw another guardian who had about a dozen Osage's fortunes that they'd managed. Um, and they had about a 50% mortality rate. And on and on it went. Now, no doubt some of these deaths were of natural causes, but it defied any natural death rate. And when I looked into some of the cases, I could find trails and clues um, and suggested pieces of evidence pointing to poisonings or murder. And so this little booklet really revealed the systematic hints of a systematic murder campaign. It was documents like that, interviews with those days that basically destroyed my original conception of the book. So after about a year and a half, I began to write a different book um, and really suggested to me that the death toll was far higher uh, than two dozen. What the exact death toll is, is impossible to say because um, these crimes were not properly investigated at the time. And these guardians weren't like, uh, so, you know, like going back to like the theory that there was, you know, that Hale kind of orchestrated everything. I, I, it was, it was coordinated effort. It was happening independently. They were right. Like, yeah. So, so Hale was a, a, a flamboyantly brutal killer. I mean, just, um, and he targeted one family and a, and a few others as well, but primarily one family, the family of Molly Burkhardt. Um, and with his nephew began to just eliminate them one by one. And this just, you know, there was poisonings. He blew up a house um, and you, you know, you, you see the movie or you can see photographs of the, of the explosion in the book. And you see the house just in wreckage, uh, killing Molly's sister, in that case, her, uh, her, her brother-in-law uh, and a maid who had been in the house. So, um, but what happened was there's evidence, these were inheritance schemes. And I think that's very important to understand. Why were they inheritance schemes? Because the Osage had, um, when they had negotiated their terms of allotment, which I won't get into, but each Osage of the tribal role was given a head right. And a head right was essentially a share in this mineral trust. So right. any oil wealth that came in, you received a payment uh, for your share. 
and a head right could not be bought or sold. It could only be inherited. So what was happening is white settlers were marrying into Osage families and then plotting to kill these people they were pretending to love and sometimes even their children. Hale had his nephew marry into Molly Burkhardt's family and orchestrate this very brutal campaign. There is evidence that other settlers were marrying into families and killing one person in that family to steal the head right, to inherit the money. And that's where you see that those, um, they were not all coordinated with Hale, they were individual, but there was a culture that was fostering this. And there was this, it's very important to understand that, that this, what, 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 what I began to understand through these interviews with Osage elders and through these documents was that this really was less a story about who did it than who didn't do it. And that it really was about this culture of killing and culture of complicity. And one of the things that's so important to understand is that the people orchestrating these crimes were some of the most prominent citizens in society. I mean, there were prosecutors, there were businessmen, there were, uh, you know, uh, sheriffs, sheriffs, there were guardians. And, and, um, and they would refer to this kind of criminal enterprise, this just general pervasive criminal enterprise in the documents as the quote unquote Indian business. Yeah. The other craziest thing about this to me, just for people that are coming in fresh, uh, which I was over the Thanksgiving break, um, like this wasn't in 1650. Not that it would have been okay in 1650, right? But, I, you know, but it, this was 100 years ago. Right? Yeah. I, I mean, like, yeah. so talk about just how that, uh, you know, I, I guess we had, you know, the, the FBI just hadn't, hadn't really formed in the way that we know it now yet. But it is kind of crazy to think about the fact that you were talking to people that, like, these are their grandparents, right? Yeah. It's not, right, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, this is, this is recent, this is present, actually. This isn't even recent history, it's present. Yeah, and when I was doing the research, it was less than 100 years ago. Um, now it's about 100 years ago today. But, um, you know, one of the people I tracked down was the granddaughter, Molly Burkhardt, yeah. uh, Margie, lovely woman. And, 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 you know, I met her and she told me oral histories about her grandmother, Molly, um, and took me out to the graveyard where so many of her um, ancestors are buried who were killed. You can see the graves of all of Molly's siblings and her mother. Um, she said to me at one point, you know, she says, I, I didn't get to go out with a lot of cousins. You know, I never understood until I fully understood Oof. what had happened, why I didn't have cousins. Um, and I remember her taking me out to, you know, where one of her sisters was killed. Um, she took me out to where the bombing was. And, you know, talking to her and talking to other Osage elders, you got a sense of how this was living history. This was very recent history. This was not colonial times. This was the birth of modern times that all this was taking place. Um, and it makes it so uh, deeply haunting. There was a piece of testimony I found that always stayed with me. I don't remember the exact words, so I will paraphrase it. But when one of the henchmen who had been hired by Hale, uh, who had carried out one of the killings, he said to an investigator, and again, this would have been in the 19, about 1926 when he was arrested. Uh, we don't, we didn't, we don't look upon killing uh, an American Indian any different than in the 1700s, and that reflected that attitudes that was taking place among these people. And so, to understand these crimes, you have to understand that yes, greed was obviously a prime motivator. They were trying to steal millions and millions of dollars. Um, but what made the crime so systematic, why they were so pervasive, pervasive is it was that greed was conjoined with the dehumanization of another people, where so many of the people carrying out these crimes did not look upon the Osage as human beings with souls and, and dignity. Tell me a little bit about uh, William K. Hale. So he is... I don't even know if robber baron is the right term, but I mean, there is a period in American life uh, through the 1920s, 1930s, where you had people like Hale. You see this everywhere. You see it in mining towns in West Virginia. You see it in the in the West, where you have a you know a single figure, a single family who controls everything locally. Right? They they own the business, they own the bank, they own the graveyard and the funeral home. They are an assistant sheriff. They literally are the law in in a 
and you know, again, a hundred years ago, a person or a family could have local control, unlike anything that even like Elon Musk could have today, right? You know, today to be super rich is to be able to exert control on a national or global scale, but you can't, you know, own a local place the way they could back then. And Hale's like that. Is he interesting at all, or is is it the banality of evil with him? It's a good question. I mean, there was. He is interesting in the sense that he represents something. And I think understanding what he kind of represents is very important. Um, he, rep you know, he showed up in Osage County as a dirt poor uh, cowboy. You know, he basically had, you know, ragged. He carried a Bible apparently with him, showed up on a horse, uh, came from Texas. Um, and then he gradually emerges as his cattle baron. And as you say, is able to gradually kind of assume and get his tentacles into every element of society in this small area. You know, he is not just a powerful uh, business figure because he's a cattle baron, but he um, dominates law enforcement. Uh, so he is a deputy sheriff who campaigns for what he calls God-fearing souls and has influence over the direction of law enforcement in the community. He does patronage so he controls the local politicians to get elected. So there is a kind of system there, a mafia, if you would like, uh, of a but, a but a kind of Western settler mafia uh, that emerged. Um, I always thought of him as fairly psychopathic in the sense that he would pretend to love the Osage while plotting to kill them um, there was always a lack of remorse in him when you would read the documents. Um, um, but he, he maintained also, his innocence all the way, right? He maintained like he his never... innocence all the way. Yeah. And, he re and, he, and he kind of reflected this kind of twisted booster philosophy. When we get to what he represented, it was this kind of ideology that he was both kind of bringing civilization. He was the avatar of civilization while destroying what had been there. Um, and that it was kind of justified. It was this very twisted ideology that he represented. And you almost have to read Cormac McCarthy to get close to it. Um, but that is kind of what he embodied and represented. Interestingly enough, I think his nephew gets to another element of your question, which is really important. His nephew was Ernest Burkhart, and he was the one who marries Molly Burkhart and, and has children with her while he's helping his uncle Hale you know, carry out these plots to kill these family members. The evidence with, with Ernest is you can see that he had a conscience in the sense that he was aware of good and evil. He was aware of right and wrong. Um, and yet he was weak and he becomes deeply complicit in these crimes. And I thought in some ways understanding Ernest is as important as understanding Hale, who helped kind of orchestrate the crimes, because he gets to that question of complicity. When you have systemic crimes, when you have crimes that are not just, okay, an individual went and did something, and you mm -hmm. can kind of say, okay, there's something wrong with that individual. We can kind of separate them from ourselves. They're punished. They're removed. But when there are systemic crimes, meaning they are cultural, they are embedded within the society, they are widespread, whether you're looking at the Holocaust or whatever you're looking at, um, but with, there are systemic crimes, they're not individual crimes. You have to have Ernest Burkhardt's. You have to have what I refer, what people refer to in the Holocaust as the willing executioners, the people who go along, who, who open the train doors, who load the bodies in, but then go back to their families and pretend to live ordinary lives. The people who are aware, they're not Hitler, they're aware of right and wrong, and yet they are complicit and go along. And so Hale, uh, uh, Ernest reflects that kind of banality of the way that evil kind of went through society. Um, so you kind of have to understand both, I think, to try to understand what really took place. They're both representative in their own ways, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah, on the question of complicity, my big the thing I most wondered and wanted to ask you about is, so like fast forwarding to 2023, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, how is it, I assume that, you know, some of these inheritance schemes worked, right? Like some of this money has gotten into the hands of descendants of the white settlers. It seems like there were oil and gas interests that were 
involved in this scheme. It's like how, like what percolates down to today as far as, yeah. as people that kind of still have yeah. not to be been all the ball on there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah There's still people receiving blood money. Um, there really are. And um, because again, these were inheritance schemes, um, people who perpetrated these crimes, um, some of them got away, some of them passed down the head rights. So there are people who still own a fraction or a portion of a head right that was stolen through murderous crimes and are still receiving much less money because the oil deposits are not generating the same yeah. level of wealth nope. that they did in the 20s, but are still maybe receiving $20,000 uh, a year uh, of blood money. And was any of that tied to like the Sinclairs or the Conoco, you know, like the big, yeah, the big you know, oil. interests yeah. that were in the region? Yeah, yeah it's a, that's a really good question too. Like how high up did this go? Um, you know, this again took place in a time when, you know, the, some of the largest deposits, if not the largest deposit, I believe in the United States at one point was sitting under Osage territory. And, um, you know, they would hold these auctions where all these oil men, oil barons would attend. And you had the Sinclairs, uh, you had J.P. Getty and his family first struck oil in Osage uh, territory, and they would attend these auctions bidding on leases for as much as a million to two million dollars. Uh, you had the Phillips brothers of Conoco were there. So you had all some of the most famous um, oil barons that we know of today uh, were present at that time. Um, I could never I never found any direct evidence implicating them in a specific crime. Um, but one of the things that I was struck by was there was a pervading and pervasive silence from them, um, at least that I could find. I never found comments from them in the newspapers. I mean, they were going to these areas when everybody knew the murders were taking place. I mean, there, there was a bombing. I mean, they literally blew up a house in town. I mean, these were small towns. And, um, and there were lots of little newspapers in the community. I mean, they, this was the day when it's hard to believe that the small town. When I go back, there were like, when I was doing archival research, there'd be like six newspapers covering, you know, a town of 3,000 people or something. I mean, it's just kind of amazing. And the names were kind of wonderful of all these papers. And um, so, you know, they knew about this and I could never see them. I never heard any of them speak out. So um, again, you know, you doesn't mean one of them didn't and I just didn't see it, but there did seem to be a general uh, complicity in silence, if nothing else, because nobody wanted to rock the boat and people were getting wealthy. All right. Uh, let's move on. I want to talk about Lost City of Z for a little bit, which I think is the book that made your career. Is that fair to say? Uh, it was my first book. Um, and uh, yeah, it certainly got me on the path to becoming, you know, an author. Brad Pitt plays you in the movie, right? No, yes, he was. I was too handsome for, uh, yes, yeah, for Brad. yeah. It was good, good Nobody casting. Nobody could play. Paul Giamatti wasn't available. And, uh, <laughs> really, so, uh, <laughs> so here's my question. So you're at the New Yorker, and it, this is David Remnick, not Tina Brown, right? Yes. Or do I have that I, wrong? David Remnick hired me. That's correct. So how do you pitch that? You say, <laughs> "Hey, David." There is, this is like Insider Magazine, Tim, this won't make any sense to you, but what, what you do when you have a long form idea is you go to the editor and you pitch, pitch this piece you want to do, but it's a weird thing because you have to have a little bit of something, but what you're doing is you're selling like the, I'm going to go discover what the story is. And you say, also the New Yorker is going to, Condé Nast is going to have to send me down to the Amazon and I'm going to trek through the Amazon and I don't know, maybe I'll find this lost city of Z and Percy Fawcett's bones and trust me, it'll be great, David. <laughs> How? You know, it, you I also was... don't really look like an explorer. No offense. Oh, I don't, no. you know, I don't want to, for people that are listening on the podcast. Well, you grew up what? Upper West Side? Or uh, you Upper I was West Side in Brooklyn guy? at the time. I, I remember, um, you know, trying to, you know, build up my muscles for that trip. I would take the stairs instead of the elevator in my building. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so it, it really, I mean, some of these, I had such some really funny pitch meetings over the years at the New Yorker um, because, you know, I, I don't know. I would just come up with these harebrained schemes and I have my um, immediate editor is, is probably is just one of the great editors of all time, uh, uh, somebody named Daniel Zaleski. And then, and, and then David Rednick, who's in charge of the magazine. And so I would kind of go into these pitch meetings into David's office. Daniel would be there. And you know, I'd start, you know, I remember this one. I said, like, so, okay, so, um, you know, I, I have this idea, you know, this explorer, he 
disappeared in the 1920s in the Amazon looking for this city, which he called the lost city of Z. I'm like, okay, all right. And well, what happened to him? And I said, oh, well, he disappeared with his uh, son and his son's best friend. And I said, and I said, no, but don't worry. You know, other people have done this. I mean, over the years, I said, well, what happened to them? Well, I said, some of them, you know, kind of disappeared or got killed or we don't really know what happened to them. And David's like, God damn. And I said, okay, all right, all right. And then I said, and they're like looking at me and I said, well, how long are you going to be gone for? I said, I don't know, like maybe two months or something. And they're like, okay, all right. <laughs> and I said, and also I, I may need to get an extra life insurance policy, um, you know, because I just had, you know, a baby um, and I want to make sure in case something happens to me that, you know, they're taking, I'm sorry. And then they said, and then they're like, all right, Godspeed. And I, I always joke, I said, either they were the most understanding and, and visionary editors I ever had, or they just basically wanted to fire me. And this was the easiest way. I'm sorry, can I interrupt? I'm sorry. I know that this is JBL's at the wheel here, but what was the pitch meeting with your wife like? I have a follow up question. Yeah. So the, my wife, who is the sensible one in the family um, and is a journalist and a producer, um, you know, she, her thing was just so funny. She said, so I started to pack for the trip and she started to like, I said, She's like, I was just like taking clothes that like from Brooklyn I had and, and like, you know, I had like, you know, like ratty, like sneakers. And she's like, David, like, you got to go to like, you got to get some stuff. Like you got to get equipment. So she's like her, near her office was, I can't remember what that place was called. It was, it's an REI, isn't it? It was an REI. Yeah, it's it an, REI. an REI. This is, I was going to ask about this literally because one of my favorite scenes in this amazing book <laughs> is towards the very front where you walk into an REI. <laughs> <laughs> and you're talking to like the gear guy there and saying, what? And he's like, where are you going? And you're like, the Amazon. And he's looking at you like, this dude's gone. This dude's yeah, dead. He's like dead. Well, and the funniest part is, too, you know, I'm such a loser. So I went into the REI store and I, you know, me, I'm just kind of looking at this. I don't camp. I don't hike. I I, I mean, I, I, I literally, I hate bugs. I never camp. Um, maybe when I was little, but, you know, I never had it in 40 years. And, um, and I and uh, I go into the store, and so you know, my, I'm just gravitated to like things that seem really cool. Like, oh my god, look! Like this, like you push some button, and things come out of it, and like really high tech, ridiculously invented things that would seem really cool to someone who wouldn't camp. And the guy in the guy store looked at me, and he says, "You've never camped before, have you?" And I said, "No." And he starts taking out these high gizmos that I had found. Like, I thought I was like going to James Bond Q. You know, I thought Q was going to be like <laughs> outfitting my expedition and like a spaceship would and he's come. Like, and he's like, socks. He's like, you yeah. need some good socks. No, that's what he said. He said, you need socks. And he's like, and we got to get you some uh, mosquito netting and you're going to need some boots and you're going to need this kind of wool socks. And yeah. so he, he outfitted me and uh, that I did. But I will say it's it's uh, somewhere back in this room somewhere but but the most foolish thing i ever did on that expedition just to underscore i'm really going on and on about how stupid i am but in any case i i for some reason again having not really camped i thought well whenever i went on a reporting trip i always would bring my my laptop my computer with me so i decided to bring my laptop with me now this was like this was like 2005 and i recently went and you know, held it that that laptop from 2005 or two, it probably was 2003 at the time because I'd had it for a couple of years. You know, it weighs like it, it, it's like lifting like like an oven or something. I mean, it's like the heaviest thing. It's like it's hard to believe when you see how technology how amazing. So I lift it. So in any case, I put this in my backpack and I'm going to take this. And so I brought this laptop with me to the Amazon. Certain, to the Amazon. And then at a certain point, I'm humping through the Amazon with, you know, for weeks and weeks. And I have this laptop and it's so damn heavy, but I didn't want to get rid of it and have my stuff on it. And I would like carry it on my head through swamps. I'm not kidding. I had it on my head at one point and I was just carrying it along. And then of course, I finally, finally get out of the Amazon. I get home. I the the, the computer survived. I turn it on and it it, it broke and it, it never worked again. So I, I always keep it around. That's amazing. A, I keep it around as a testament to my uh, foolhardiness. <laughs> so I uh, I mean I do do a little bit of camping and outdoorsy stuff. Yeah. And the prospect of going to the Amazon terrifies me. Uh, did it terrify you while you were there? And weren't you, you know, lost at one point? Yes, I did get lost at one point, and that was pretty terrifying. Um. And it did give me a glimpse. I mean, you know, what's interesting is I tend to not think about things when I'm doing my 
these expeditions or these missions, I think, well, I just need to get there. And I just kind of, I'm a little like Magoo, which is probably, I date myself now. Most people will remember Magoo, from the cartoon character, but I just kind of go. But then what will often happen is if I come back, I then begin to learn more. I remember with the, with the Lost City of Z, um, I had a fact checker for the book. And one of the, the people in the book I wrote about was one of Fawcett's companions, like the British explorer who disappeared. And he gets these, like, these little things like with these bots, I don't even know what they call them, that would, would fall on their skin and then worms would burrow under the skin. They were these awful, awful worms. And his whole body gets taken over by these worms and you have to pull them out. And so one day the fact checker came into my office and said, you know, I want to show you something. And they had found a video on YouTube of somebody in you know more recent times of one of these worms being pulled out of their back. And it was the most disgusting thing I'd ever seen. And I said, thank God I only saw this now because had I seen that before, I never would have gone. <laughs> so, <laughs> so sometimes ignorance, for better or worse, ignorance is not a bad thing. It's better not to know. I am terrified of snakes. So I, and I dreaded seeing an anaconda. And thank God I didn't see one. <laughs> So uh, can we? Get, I want to talk a little bit, a little bit biography, so people can get a Wait, sense. Can of Can I do one more lesson? Yeah, because I'm ahead. dying to Sorry, ask you this. Uh, this was I, I read this like in 2006. I was yeah. like refreshing myself on the plane yeah. last night. But um, like the interesting thing to me about that story, right, is that you know this guy in you know in the exploratory times, whatever we're calling this, in the 1600s, is going to find this city of gold and maize, right? And then you fast forward 400 years or however many hundred years to when you are going back to 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 look at this and I, I, there is this accepted conventional wisdom right that like yeah there was some society there but you know the thing that they he was looking for was a myth and you know that that a, a society can't get created in this type of environment and you need certain type of conditions for an advanced society to create and and you're investigation kind of uncovers that like maybe Fawcett was actually onto something and but but the book kind of ends with that, right? And so I'm curious, yeah. like now we're, it's been 16 years or whatever. Like, have there been more discoveries in that regard? Uh, have yeah. you followed that story? Yeah, very much so. Um, I'm glad you asked that. Yeah, I mean, to me, it was interesting when I began that book. I was originally kind of more interested in kind of what had happened to Fawcett, why, what was his fate, what had happened to him yeah. and his son. And the more I did research, the more I became fascinated with this other mystery of. Could these very complex societies have existed uh, in earlier times in the Amazon and constructed these very complex uh, architectures and, and civilizations? And the assumption, the longstanding assumption was that was not possible um, because later explorers would kind of come into the area and they would see only kind of small uh, tribal communities. Um, and they thought the Amazon was too hostile a place to support large civilizations and there wasn't enough food base to support them. Um, and yet, uh, one of the explorers I wrote about is, was a man named Michael Heckenberger, who had found evidence of these complex societies in the very place where Fawcett believed they might exist. Now they were not made of gold or anything like that, kind of, but, um, you know, they had causeways and moats, um, and they disappeared uh, right at the time the people disappeared are dated to kind of right when the early conquistadors first arrived in the Amazon. So disease had wiped them out. And um, it was discoveries like that. And as you asked, many discoveries since of these other complex society, archeological ruins that are being discovered in part, sadly, because of deforestation, um, they're finding more and more, but there have been many more of these um, ruins uh, discovered, these kind of massive earthworks, uh, complex irrigation systems, uh, deeply engineered um, that, you know, some archaeologists have compared to, you know, the Egyptian pyramids. So, uh, yes, there have been more discoveries and these are kind of shattering the kind of longstanding assumptions about what the Amazon and the Americas looked like before the arrival of Christopher Columbus, and also revealed a certain prejudice about the way uh, early archaeologists had looked upon uh, the indigenous people of the Amazon, and a failure to understand the impact that disease had brought so that, that when future archaeologists were kind of coming in and to the region or visitors, what they were seeing was the legacy of disease that had wiped out and destroyed uh, so many people. Well, 
uplifting. Um, Sorry. I, 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 <laughs> yeah. And we haven't even gotten to the wager, which I think might be the darkest of all your books. So quick, quick uh, bit of biography. So you and I meet, we are both uh, sort of young writers. You're a little bit older than me in DC. You're working at the New Republic. I'm working at the Weekly Standard. And so what we are both doing is basically like 1,500 word to 2,000 word politics stories, which is what these weekly political magazines do. And then you leave the New Republic and you went to the New Yorker. And I remember at the time thinking to myself, huh, that's a weird move for David. Uh, and then you start, I start reading your stuff with the New Yorker. David, that's a weird move for David Grant or David Remnick to hire David Grant. <laughs> Both. Combo. Which David? Both. But that's Both. why he sent me to the Amazon. He's yeah. like, oh, mistake. I should have hired this guy. And, uh, and I think the first of your pieces that I read there, and I may be wrong about this, is the giant squid hunter, which is about to start. Was that your first New Yorker piece? That was one of my first pieces. It wasn't the first. I did a couple, two pieces freelance, and then that was my first piece on staff. Yes. So here is here is my analogy. It is like you are working at your normal office job, and you got this guy David at the cubicle next to you, and he's really good at his office job too, and it's great. And then he leaves for the NBA, and you discover that David is actually Michael Jordan. And you're like, what the fuck was he doing working in an office next to me, doing these fifteen hundred word pieces? Because he's the greatest basketball player in the history of the game. He should have just been playing <laughs> basketball the whole time. And so it was, I mean, the, the New Republic, this is not the fault of the New Republic, but a, a weekly political magazine is not set up to allow a writer to do what it is you do. And so I, I guess the, the first question I have is, did you know all along that that's what you wanted to do? Because you grew up in publishing. And I assume that that sort of shaped your your world. Your mom is like a legendary figure in, in publishing in New York. So here's my, my, my yeah. big overarching question. When did you know that this thing that you do as the best, again, the best nonfiction writer reporter of his generation, that's what, that's what David is. When did you know that that's the field you Can wanted I just to labor intervene in? Intervene really quick. There's no shame yeah. in doing fifteen hundred uh, fifteen hundred word articles about random congressional Look, it's figures. fine. Okay. But there are a lot of people who can do that. <laughs> All right, anyway, go back to the question. I just right. want to throw that out there. <laughs> Got my own. You know, writing is a, is a journey, and um, I, you know, kind of early on had aspirations to be a writer, but I really never knew what form it would take. And I, um, you know, I would write poetry. I wrote some fiction. I wrote obituaries for a, a newspaper in Connecticut. Um, uh, high school graduations I covered. Uh, I thought you'd be a good obituary writer. Uh, Did you have some good ones? Well, actually, you know, I think being an obit writer is one of the more interesting, actually. Good obits. I still I'm, I have a real partial for the for good old obits. Um, but it also teaches you something fundamental, which is why they always give it to young cub reporters, is if you make a mistake, you will hear about it. If you have, um, it's, you know, it's, to the poor grieving people who call you, you feel really awful and you say, okay, I better never make a mistake again. Um, and uh, so I never kind of knew what form it would take. And, and, and sometimes, you know, forces, you don't always control your forces. So I, I needed a job. I needed a job. Um, I had kind of struggled to kind of freelance and do things. And the Hill newspaper had a, was a new newspaper covering Capitol Hill was starting up. And so I took a job there. I was actually a copy editor, which is kind of funny because I have really bad eyesight. So people always laugh at me. I could barely see. And, um, and then eventually there was an opening at the New Republic and I went there. And so you're kind of suddenly being carried by forces that you don't completely control. You know, you got a job at the Hill. They say, well, you cover Capitol Hill. I remember when I was at the New Republic, I kept saying, well, can I cover something else? And they were always like, no, well, you're the Congress person. You cover Congress. That's what you do. You got to go to Capitol Hill and go interview uh, Newt Gingrich. And I said, but, you know, there's this weird crime and this, um, and, and, you know, I, I, I uh, and, and I there remember, were some crimes there. I guess you could have done Mark Foley maybe at the, wasn't that, wouldn't that have been uh, the time? Well, I, I wonder if Foley was actually well, was a little, little after, after, right a little after, after. after. but um, to your to your point, um, there was a pivotal moment in where kind of shaped me, and it was actually at the New Republic, which is um, I was doing a story on Congressman James Trafficking. I don't know how many people remember yeah. Trafficking with, oh, yeah. with, with his crazy hair, which turned out to be a toupee, who would drop the f bomb and say, "Beam me up, Scotty," on the uh, 
uh, on the House floor all the time. He, so I had learned that he was being investigated by the feds. And I went out to Ohio to do a story on him. I went to Youngstown, where he was from. And I discovered in an archive a transcript. And it was a transcript of a recording that was made by uh, of the trafficant when he was running for sheriff many years earlier. And it was made by, a, by two mobsters, Orly the Crab, I think it was Lenny the Crab, it might not, I'm trying to remember. They were the Cravia brothers, but they were the Crab brothers. And they were two mobsters. One of them had since disappeared and quite literally been rubbed out, never seen again. And there was a recording of him when, when they were meeting, a secret recording with him when they were meeting with Traffic and when he was running for sheriff. And, they, and here I could suddenly hear Traffic talking about taking bribes from the mob, talks about people coming, coming up swimming in the Mahoning River if they crossed them swearing every other word. And I said, this is the honorable gentleman from Ohio. And, and it was one of these kind of moments when I thought, wait a second, this is how he really speaks. This is the power of archival information. But more than that, this is the kind of story I want to tell. These are the stories I really want to tell. And so I did that story and then that began a slow, but it was a long process. You know, editors still would, you know, want me always to do a certain thing. Um, and that was really the big change at the New Republic was David and Daniel eventually said, okay, this guy's got these weird obsessions. Let's just let him do them. Let's just let him do them. And I think that for me was, it wasn't just the support and the infrastructure, it was a kind of willingness and openness, openness to let me pursue my passions, which always kind of went against the grain, you know, because I didn't really want to cover the celebrity. Like, even when I covered the McCain uh, campaign, you know, I always wanted to cover the loser. I never wanted to cover the winner. <laughs> so, uh, The Wager. Yes. Your latest book. You do a lot of dark stuff. I think The Wager is the darkest. Um, the well, whole... it will make you feel better about your own life. I will coming say from J Coming from JVL, uh, this, was <laughs> like, this is like an anti-endorsement of this book, I just have to say. I mean, I'm sure it's very good and very you're t very talented, but if it's too dark for JVL, it's like, I can't. I can't. All right, so here, you give, give me your, again, better at this than I am, but, uh, but give, give, give the people the 30-second the version. Yeah, so it was a story that uh, took place in the 1700s when an expedition set off in search of a Spanish galleon filled with treasure. Um, and one of the ships in the expedition was the Wager. And after battling scurvy and typhoons, it eventually gets shipwrecked on a desolate island where the officers and the crew slowly descend into this Hobbesian state of depravity with murder and mutiny and even cannibalism. Um, part of the story that so intrigued me was that some of them incredibly make it back to England. Um, and after everything they've been through, they are summoned to face a court martial for their alleged crimes. And, um, you know, the joke is, you know, we always say, you know, you got to tell your stories in order to live, as Joan Didion said. But in their case, it's quite literally true because if they don't tell a convincing tale, they could be hanged after everything they've been through. So it sparked this kind of furious war over the truth. And it was at a, a moment in our history when I was, you know, we are undergoing our own perilous um, situation where we are filled with disinformation and misinformation and quote unquote alternative facts. And we've kind of foregone our skepticism and our empiricism to often determine the truth. And so I found in this weird story, this kind of odd parable, which is, you know, it's a crazy story in terms of adventure and, and, and survival, but it also had these other themes, which is what really drew me to it. So the, the British Navy sends this, this group of ships out because they're at war with the Spanish and they they have intelligence saying that there's going to be a Spanish treasure galleon down uh, off the coast of Patagonia. So we're at the very southern tip of South America. And everything about this mission is is tragic, right? It's, it's a terrible idea. It's done at the absolute wrong time of year. Everything that could go wrong with it goes wrong with it. They can't even get out of port on time from from England. And this pall of doom is just hanging over the enterprise from the very first moments. And I guess we, we're wrapping up on time, 
But I think in a weird way, we've circled back to your very first question about McCain and about larger forces. And this is one of those things where, again, there are just larger forces at work, right? There, there are the imperatives of empire. There is the logic of war. There is, and we see this with Killers of Flower Moon, right? There are larger systemic forces at work here. And I, I think maybe your books in a weird way answer that dialectical question, right? You know, when you have these sliding doors moments, can people change things or are we all sort of, you know, really at the mercy of these bigger things that are happening around us? Yeah. It's such a big question. I don't know if I, I, I wish I knew the answer. You can see how people can impose their will, for example, in the wager in certain moments and have demonstrations of heroism at time. Uh, um, but you also see them being subject to the whims of the systems that they are part of, to the fates and the elements, to a war that is bungled from the start um, and is, is not designed correctly. And you see people sacrificing and dying for a system that they're not even fully conscious of when you read their records uh, of these larger forces. And that was one of the things that struck me about the wager that um, one of the lessons I took away from it, even in our own time, is I don't know if I know the answer to your question, but I think it is important for us to be aware of these forces when we are within them. Because one of the things that struck me when I read the journals of these officers and crew of the wager is how often they are unaware of these larger systemic forces that are compelling them and in many cases, ripping them apart and costing their lives. They are often complicit in a system they are not even con fully conscious of. Hmm. Do you ever consider for your next thing, like an Aquila and the Bees type story of like a young girl <laughs> from an inner city who does well in a spelling bee? You know, some, something well, my, a little my, my, my wife and kids are really advocating, like, could I find something on like a nice island where, you know, uh, you know, I visited Wager Island, which was crazy. They're like, can you, can, can you find a place where we could go, you know, somewhere maybe off the coast of France and There's we could just spend seasons. a couple of years? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? uh, David, thank you. But I always like to ask uh, before we go, just um, any recommendations from you, anything out there that you're reading or looking at that is that you would point our, our listeners to? Yeah, um, you know, I just read um, a, 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 a really, I thought, remarkable book called uh, Small Mercies, uh, Small Mercies, I believe it's called, by uh, Dennis Lehane. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's set as all his novels are in um, the Boston area. Um, and, you know, it's a, all his stories are gripping, but it has an unbelievably vivid uh, female protagonist that will stay with me. And it explores a lot of these forces. It's set during busing uh, in Boston at that period of uh, integration. And um, it kind of it uses fiction. Um, and the techniques of fiction, I think, to explore some of these themes of racism, which we've been talking about today. I, just, I thought it was, you know, I thought it was one of his best and a really a great novel and also a great read. I appreciate that uh, suggestion very much. And you taking the time to spend with us. This has been marvelous. We could have done five hours. Uh, maybe we can just get the gang back together for a little pickup hoops um, <laughs> next time I'm, uh, I'm up in New York. You never <laughs> know. I'd Anytime. like to see how your skills. Yeah, then anytime, and then we can do it from the infirmary right afterwards. <laughs> yeah, we can go down to Soul in the Hole, see if they'll let us run. It'll be great. Um, David Grand, thank you so much um, for your time. Everybody go out and watch Killers of the Flower Moon. If you're really looking for some holiday cheer, uh, check out The Wager also in this Christmas season. And uh, we'll be, uh, we'll hopefully, we can do this again sometime. Thanks. My guys. pleasure. Thanks, guys.